Welcome to session 57 of the World of Speculative Fiction series. Today we are going to be discussing this massive tome, a single novel by Neil Stevenson, Anathem, which came out in 2008 and uh, has been, you know, read by, by millions of people worldwide, as it points out on the jacket, number one New York Times bestseller, at least back in the day, and it is a, a book that people have rather strong opinions about for reasons that we'll talk about in a bit. I want to say two things before we actually get started. So the first is, if you're new to this series, this is a set of talks that were originally face-to-face -face hosted at the Brookfield Public Library beginning in 2016. There is an entire playlist of all the previous ones. Uh, we've got others lined up in advance and there's sort of a regular sequence to this. Once a month there is a talk and we focus on world building. We talk usually a little bit about the biography of the authors and we look at philosophical themes in the works and you know this novel in, in particular has a lot of philosophical themes because they were deliberately <laughs> placed there. But there's others that we can raise as well and discuss. When COVID hit, we went on hiatus for a bit because we couldn't meet at the library. And then we meandered our way into this new format where I do a presentation by video for about an hour and a half, sometimes going a bit longer. And then we spend some time uh, engaging in a video conferencing with the people who are the really dedicated fans who want to talk about this or other uh, speculative fiction matters or even just philosophy. So that's thing number one. Thing number two, it's been a while since I have done one of these because I've been hung up on this book for quite a while. Um, we're going to talk about the nature of this book in just a little bit, but I, I want to say this. It is, for many people, a slow and rough start. I would say I had to get, you know, at least 200, maybe 250 pages in before I was getting even really that interested in the work. And that may have more to do with me than with the work itself or with you as a reader, but I, you know, it is something that is, we're going to see reviewers talking about this. It might take a while for you to get into it. And, you know, I found myself each month having to put off the session that what we're doing right here to another month until I could actually finish the, the whole book. Now, granted, some of that is due to my own busyness and, but some of it also had to do with, you know, slowly trudging through the the molasses of the first yeah first third of the book and then you know getting into the swing and being able to proceed with the the rest of this massive volume so i think that's kind of an important uh feature the last thing i'll say right here is that if you um are, haven't read the book, there are going to be some spoilers ahead. I don't think that they're going to be spoiler spoilers in the sense of, oh, the story is, you know, just completely damaged and we can't read it or think about it anymore. But there are going to be some spoilers. We can't discuss this book without going into some of those. Um, I don't know that that many people are going to read their way through this entire thing. But if this, if this you know, presentation helps get you interested in the book, that's great. If you've already read it, and you you know you find something that you want to talk about, you can write something in the comments or in the live chat when this is running, and uh, you know I'll be happy to address that. So, all that said, let's jump into looking at the world itself, some some biography, some philosophical themes. We are also going to be looking at uh, Stevenson's own interviews, uh, which might be a, a good place to start with this, and some of the reviews that I think bring up important 
points about this work. Before we launch into the discussions of world building and Stevenson's own takes on Anathem and, and what he's trying to do in it and some of the philosophical themes and what other people have had to say about it, we should do a brief biographical exposition. Here we have a living author and one who is hopefully not near the end of his career. So uh, there's, there's a lot to say, but also there's not quite as long of a timeline. Stevenson is in his early 60s at this point in time. So, you know, it's not this, this massive backstory like some of the authors that we've gone into before. <clears throat> so he's born in uh, 1959 in Fort Meade, Maryland, and he comes from, you could, you could say, a technical and intellectual family. His father was a professor of electrical engineering. His mother worked in a biochemistry laboratory. So we've got two science-oriented people growing up in the household that he's growing up in. Her father was a biochemistry professor. So not only in terms of technical capacity and the sciences, but also a connection with uh, universities and research. And Stevenson, um, you know, grows up in this environment. His family moves to Champaign-Urbana, which if, if you don't know the geography of the Midwest, that is where the flagship uh, state university of Illinois happens to be. You know, there's lots of other Illinois colleges and universities, but that one is sort of the, the big one, sort of like UW-Madison or sort of like, uh, nor, you know, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the one that gets the best funding, the one that has the most people gathered there. It's the one that in a certain respect is the most university town. And then uh, eventually they move to Ames, Iowa, um, Stevenson is going to graduate from Ames High School, and then he's going to go to Boston University. So kind of a, a trek. And he first specializes in physics. He actually works as a teaching assistant in the physics department. And then he switches to geography. And you might say, well, that's kind of a weird thing to do, isn't it? And there's a few things to say about geography. So the official thing that you find out in the research is that he switched to geography because he found out this would give him more time on the computer mainframe than being a physics major, which he continued to minor in. And you could say, well, how, how the hell would that be the case? Well, you know, uh, geography was it, it, and still is a very multidisciplinary discipline. As a matter of fact, in the time that he's in, it was it was kind of a growing discipline. And there were lots of problems that required the use of statistical modeling or, you know, computer uh, algorithms. But there weren't that many people who were old school who were getting into that. So it would make sense that as opposed to a discipline like physics or mathematics or, God forbid, computer science, uh, geography people would be sharing like maybe the same amount of, of total time among fewer students. But geography was also, like I said, a multidisciplinary discipline at that time. And so that would have exposed him to interconnections between uh, the various disciplines, which I think is, is quite important for the development of um, somebody who's going to be doing the kind of work that Stevenson would do. Um, he, he worked as a research assistant uh, for the U.S. Department of Energy in Ames, uh, Iowa. He also worked as a researcher for the Corporation for a Cleaner Commonwealth in Boston. And then he finally graduates in 1981 with a B.A. in geography and a minor in physics. And then, you know, he works as a clerk in, in a library and he's, he's starting to do some writing. His first two novels... Um, didn't get much play at all. The Big U, which is, you know, sort of a looking at a, a university town, you, you write what you know, right? And he publishes that in 1984. So just a few years after he gets out of college, then he marries uh, Ellen Marie Lackerman uh, the year after that. They will have two children together. He publishes another more thriller oriented novel called Zodiac. And then finally makes it big in 1992 with Snow Crash. And this is a 
cyberpunk, sometimes described as post-cyberpunk novel, which brings together a whole bunch of the themes that were floating around at the time. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some social uh, commentary in it about uh, capitalism, collectivism, corporations, stuff like that. There's a lot of computer stuff, a lot of speculation about what the, the Internet is going to look like. You know, obviously, who's, who's the big uh, person on the scene? William Gibson. This is sort of like taking Gibson stuff perhaps a little bit further. And then he uh, works with his uncle to, to publish um, some other things as well. In 1995, he publishes The Diamond Age or a Young Lady's Illustrated Primer. And a little bit after that, this is 1999, um, he tells us that he was present at the origins of Blue Origin, originally Blue Operations LLC, and was its only employee for a little while. And so he did all sorts of things from, you know, laying Ethernet cable to, you know, putting systems together. And this is his, his look into an entrepreneurial landscape, you could say. Um, that same year, he brings out Cryptonomicon. And, uh, you know, this will eventually win the Prometheus Hall of Fame Award. Following that, in 2003, 2004, and 2004 again, he will bring out this Baroque cycle, originally three books, broken up into more books later on. Uh, System of the World wins the Prometheus Award, so now he's really starting to get some, some notice. 2006, he leaves Blue Origin because he's finding it's just becoming like another aerospace company. In 2008, he write, or publishes Anathem, and this will win the Locus Award for Best Science Fiction Novel in 2000. Nine. So that's the story up until the publishing of Anathem. What has he been doing after that? In 2010, um, he's named chairman of the Subutai Corporation, and they begin the production of a, a multimedia fiction project called the Mongoliad, and Stevenson is writing part of that along with some other speculative fiction writers. He also publishes a novel called Read Me uh, in 2011, which centers around um, some, some you know, massive online uh, game developers caught in, in uh, some real life things with some, some really bad guys. Um, in 2012, he branches out in another direction, launching a Kickstarter campaign for a realistic sword fighting fantasy game, which would use uh, motion control to provide an immersive experience. It was called Clang. They managed to hit the funding goal and um, they, they accepted uh, you know, further donations. And then by 2013 as is the case with so many things where there's funding, they run out of it. They use it all up, right? And they never really deliver on the product. Um, a lot of the backers get quite angry. It ends in 2014 without being completed, leading some people to threaten a class action lawsuit. 2014, he's also hired as chief futurist, which is kind of a cool uh, title, a cool gig to have by uh, the augmented reality company Magic Leap. And I should say this, in his interviews, um, Stevenson is less bullish on virtual reality, a completely immersed you know, thing where we jack in and we're in some virtual world and we're all on our own. And he's much more bullish about augmented reality where we're you know we're moving around in the world that we inhabit but it's been an augmented in some way you might remember back uh in the day with you know the the glasses google glass was bringing out these glasses that would have things going on on there and we called the people wearing them glass holes because they were narcissistically oblivious to everybody else around them um you know and, and so augmented reality is is kind of like that it's not you're not going completely into a fantasy world. You might think about, uh, you know, a great example of that was the Pokemon craze, right? Before COVID, people were out and about, you know, catching Pokemons all over the place through their phones. Um, that would be an example of augmented reality. So he joins uh, Magic Leap to... to um, work on that sort of stuff. Publishes a couple more works. Um, uh, Seven Eves in 2015, The Rise and Fall of Dodo in 2017, 
And um, in 2019, he publishes this novel, Fall or Dodge in Hell. And uh, it contains some characters from some of his early works. 2020, he gets laid off from Magic Leap, which is, you know, uh, cutting people and stuff like that. And then he makes some lemons out of that, that or he makes some lemonade out of, out of those lemons. That would be the reverse, wouldn't it? Uh, he and his colleagues, uh, Stuart and Grossman, release Newfound Land, The Long Hall, an audible audio drama based on intellectual property they developed at Magic Leap. Finally, his latest book, published in 2021, uh, very recently, Termination Shock, a climate fiction novel about solar geoengineering featuring some interventions to try to deal with the climate crisis. And, you know, he did some interviews about this recently. I'll just mention this because we're going to talk about other interviews in just a bit. And he says, um, you know, the climate crisis there, there are these events like the heat wave in Seattle that killed people, and this is going to keep happening in other places. But that doesn't get everybody's imagination, psyches captured the way that rising sea levels do. When you are underwater or water is seeping in, suddenly you realize that there is a problem. So that's probably enough about biography at this point. It's always good to hear from an author, him or herself, about the work that they're doing. And, you know, we're really fortunate with Neil Stevenson to have a living author who has given a number of interviews about his work in general and specifically about this novel. There's a lot of material out there. Um, I'm just going to read you a few of the things from some of the interviews that I, I think are particularly helpful or revealing. So on the book page um, for Anathem, he tells us, In 1999, Danny Hills asked me and several other people to contribute back of napkin sketches depicting our conceptions of the clock of the long now. These were never intended as serious design proposals. It was more of an exercise to show how different people thought about the idea. At the time, many newspapers and magazines had been publishing end of decade, end of century, and even end of millennium news summaries in addition to the end of year ones that come out every December. I got to thinking about the amount of time and energy I spend each day keeping up on current events I know I'm going to forget in 24 hours. What if I only read the newspaper once a year, once a decade, once a century? I'd know a lot less about current events, but I'd have plenty of spare bandwidth to think about other things. I embodied these musings into my back of napkin sketch for Danny, which depicted a system of concentric walls surrounding the clock tower and enclosing cloistered communities with progressively deeper separation from current events. That simply is the basis for the world depicted in Anathem, in the maths with, you know, those that open have an apert once a year, once a decade, once a century, once a millennium with different communities of people inside, the, the possibility of moving back and forth between them, and the different, what we might say, courses of development that would be enabled by this disconnection from the larger secular world. There's an MIT interview in which he was asked about um, one idea or concept that inspired the new novel, Anathem. Um, and here he was a little bit more cagey. He says, in general, I prefer the reader to decide, but I don't want to be totally Sphinx-like, and so I'll permit myself to say a little. As far as culture and politics are concerned, the important theme is long attention span versus short attention span thinking. I'm sure your readers can think of any number of ways in which having a longer attention span can be useful, but I'll name one. Bankers with long attention spans don't lend money to people who can't pay it back. What's he referring to there? Uh, the uh, financial collapse that began in uh, 2007 and extended into 2008 and well into the 2010s, right? Why did that happen? Because bankers made a lot of stupid, you know, uh, very short-term decisions about shaky financial instruments that they didn't understand very well and about the housing market and about, and about, it was all short-term thinking rather than long attention span thinking. 
Um, if he said, we, if we had bankers who adopted a long-term view of their responsibilities, we might not be in the middle of a financial crisis that is blowing away 150-year-old investment banks. So what would it be like to have a society in which at least a portion of that society is not thinking in terms of the next quarter, the next year, the next uh, few years, the next election cycle, but rather in terms of decades, hundreds of years, millennia of development, ongoing development? Good question. In the uh, LA Times interview, Scott Timberg asks him a number of questions. The first is, Anathem is set on a different planet in a different universe. And Neil Stevenson says, as a kid reading science fiction, I was always fascinated with parallel universe situations. Situations where someone gets jumped into another universe that's similar to ours with a hand-wavy pseudo-physics uh, explanation for how it happened. I wanted to come up with my own hand-wavy pseudo-physics explanation. Now, isn't that an interesting thing to say? Because, you know... You, there is a physics theory basis for the four previous civilizations, including our own, who uh, come to to uh, Arb and you know interact with the inhabitants there. But it's you know it's pseudo physics, right? It's you could call it philosophical, speculative physics if you wanted. Uh, the next question, your books are driven by ideas, but they've got to have something else to work as novels. Neil Stevenson says, oh, there's a lot of ideas that bang around. They're kind of like seeds which fall on barren ground. And on a good day, I can take one of those ideas and see how it fits in with some characters and a story. And then I've got something. If that's not there, it's all a complete waste of time. Um, he also says uh, that he doesn't plot out the timelines and structures of his world uh, necessarily. He says, if you do it that way, you're at some hazard of shortchanging what people really read books for, which is characters and stories. It's better to take a leap of faith and start telling the story. It's probably a rookie mistake. If you lack confidence in your ability to fill all that in, you'll sit a long time working on the map. And then finally, he's asked about Canticle for Leibowitz, Walter Miller's uh, book. What about it? That has a post-apocalyptic monastery setting. And did that have an influence on your new novel? And then uh, Stevenson, I think this is great, says, it's a different premise from Anathem in a lot of ways. When people hear about monks in sci-fi, that's the one they think of, and rightly so. But when you look at it from a geek's point of view, there must have been zillions of science fiction books over the year with monks in them. Um, Canticle for Leibowitz shouldn't be our automatic go-to reference point. And this highlights a, a danger that, that comes up within uh, a lot of um, criticism. You know, well, this has something in common with this, so therefore there must be a connection between them, when that isn't really necessarily the case. Um, there's, a, there's a very interesting interview in Goodreads where um, it's, you know, he's being asked, uh, as an intellectual yourself, um, would you find the technology-obsessed future world in which people are focused on immediate gratification, would you find this living situation to be a utopia or a prison? And Stevenson says, it's meant to be ambiguous in that way. I'm not going to kill the ambiguity by giving you a straight answer. But I will point out that in the world of the book, the ones in the cloisters are free to leave at any time. They can go back onto the general population and try to make their way in a world like anyone else. So they're making a decision every day as to whether it's a utopia or a prison and whether the outside would be better or worse. Um, then there's a, a discussion about the glossary of terms. And Stevenson says, I'm hoping the book is accessible to habitual science fiction readers and non-science fiction readers alike. One of the skills that science fiction readers develop after reading a few thousand science fiction novels is picking up the details of a new world through a kind of osmosis. They just plunge and start reading. Unfamiliar names and words appear. Undeterred, they plow ahead. Slowly, their subconscious mind assembles a picture of the world. By page 100 or so, they know the meanings of all those words. Every kid in America knows the meanings of words like 
Horacrux and Wizengamot that are used in the Harry Potter novels, but there's also many readers who are more accustomed to books in which every word can be looked up in a dictionary, and they find it distracting or even annoying to encounter new terms in a work of fiction. For them, I included a glossary. Use it or not, depending on what sort of reader you are. Now, I'll admit, I actually have used the glossary, uh, so maybe maybe I'm the kind of reader who likes the, you know, let's stick in the, the, the language that we already have, right? Um, I think there's really something here. This is a really great point that he's making. When we're going into a narrative world, we do pick things up. Um, I don't know if we would call it osmosis. There's an associative process that takes place. Um, read enough other literature in this, uh, this world, in other areas, and you will pick it up as well. A great example of this is reading... Um, stuff in Stoicism, where the words don't always mean what we think that they typically mean, and there's all sorts of technical terms. Read enough, read around enough in the classic texts, and eventually things start to coalesce, and you're like, ah, I can see the world the way that they're, they're portraying it. Well, we can see the world as Stevenson is portraying it through the eyes of Fra Erasmus, right? Um, and so... Oh, actually, other characters, too. We, we do get a lot of other points of view being brought in, even though Erasmus is the point of view uh, narrator. So, you know, I think he's, he's, he's right about this. And, you know, the uh, lexicon can be a little bit uh, precious and annoying at times. But, you know, if you write a thousand page book, I guess you get to do that. right? There's another uh, interesting interview in Scientific American, uh, in Anathem, the central core concept of the book is that consciousness, and this is what we get much later on, is a quantum mechanical property. That's a new and controversial idea. Did you read popular science articles to bone up on those concepts? And um, Stevenson says, well, that's actually an idea that's been around for a while. The hardline position is that the brain is too wet and too warm to allow for quantum effects. There's also the insurgent position that evolution may have found a way to take advantage of quantum effects, even though it is a warm and wet environment. Chloroplasts and plants may make use of quantum superposition to do what they do. It's an open question in science. Between the mainstream, the hardliners who say it's impossible with what we already know, and the fringe, people who say it's possible but they use methods that are not generally accepted, there are people in the middle who try to figure out what may be true. It's in the middle where the good material for science fiction comes from, these are areas of current interest that can turn a story. Well, that's another interesting insight, isn't it? So as opposed to like the, you know, what it is that science at the time is teaching us, the, you know, the consensus, which may not be a genuine consensus, um, and the fringe, which may include all sorts of kooky people and, you know, weird, whacked out stuff, but also some legitimate outliers. There's a middle area where we can work from. And I think this is, uh, this is kind of a interesting concept that Stevenson is putting forth there in terms of world building and, um, literary development, right? Um, there's a long interview in Gizmodo uh, that's summarized by, by the writer. And um, he, so here's, I'm going to just read some sections from this and then maybe comment on a bit of it. I asked Stevenson about this alliance between the Avut and Deoliters. The Deoliters are people who, who um, believe that there is a God and, you know, obviously worship the God. And he said, I take issue with your reading of the book here. I don't really think the scientists and the deoliters forge an alliance. To me, this seems like an unduly feel-good reading of the book. During the last half of the book, they work together under the terms of the Reconstitution, which is a 3,700-year-old document. At the very end, we see a few tentative bridges being constructed between the Avut and a minority of the deoliters who happen to be unusually compatible with them. But that's way too strong to say that they're forging an alliance. It's not science and religion coming together and, you know, one big happy family. Um, he goes on and he, and he says, Since Stevenson's already mentioned the novel is at least a tip of the hat to earthly politics, 
I wondered whether he sees any reconciliation possible between science and religion in our own culture. Does he believe this reconciliation would be like on Arb, where a few deolaters can work with the Avut, but the two cultures remain essentially hostile to each other? And Stevenson replies, there are many, many examples of legitimate scientists who espouse some kind of religious faith. So I don't see any existential hostility, essential hostility. I grew up in a community of church-going scientists and engineers. The re recent science religion fireworks are driven by a theological movement that is as controversial within Christianity as it is in secular culture. We could call this fundamentalism if we wanted to, although generally that in religious studies that's reserved for the actual fundamentalists, and it includes you know, um, you know, conservative Catholics and, and evangelicals and all sorts of other denominations, <clears throat> all of which have in common a commission, a, a, you know, commitment to culture wars and a emphasis on a incoherent literal reading of the Bible. I say incoherent because the, the, the readings aren't really that literal. Uh, they're selectively literal, right? And, and that is, is incompatible with not only real science, but also the I effing love science people, you know, and, and the people who are kind of like um, hangers on and fanboys of the science that they don't actually understand, but just read about in, in, in science, you know, articles and magazines and things like that. Um, the, again, the middle ground includes a lot of overlap, right? Um, there's one other thing I'm going to read from that. Uh, I asked Stevenson a pretty detailed question about the philosophy in his novel. Most of the action in Anathem centers on how the people of Arb deal with aliens who have traveled to their planet from other timelines. As the characters discuss how this has come about, they speculate that timeline travel might move in one direction towards timelines that are closer to a mathematical or philosophical ideal. I asked Stevenson, as a very interesting question, whether he thinks Arb, the, the world depicted here, is more ideal than Earth because its cultures have chosen to segregate theoretical scientists from engineers and politicians. He answered in philosophical fashion after warning me again, this is a huge spoiler. He then explained, this is really a question about the word ideal. Philosophers and non-philosophers use it to mean different things. Non-philosophers generally use it to mean really good, as in this house is ideal for my family or I want to find the ideal job. Philosophers use it to mean something is more platonic. This doesn't necessarily mean something is good, but something closer to a pure form. So in that sense, Arb is more ideal than Earth, not better than but simplified and streamlined in a way that happens to be useful for me as a novelist. I think that's a great insight about what's going on in here. So these are all things that Stevenson himself is telling us about his own work as we find it in this novel. There is a lot to say about the world building involved in this novel, Anathem, and the plot and the world building and character development are all connected together in complex ways, which, you know, is a good sign. It's not just, well, let's build a world and then, like, just throw the characters into it. Instead, because of the point of view of... Uh, uh, Fra Erasmus being the main character and the one whose who's, uh, eyes the story is being told through. We're getting bits of pieces here and there. And there's, there's a good bit of exposition here and there in the work. Uh, a lot of revelations that are going to be taking place. And it, it is indeed a real world, that a narrative world that has been created. Uh, to give a spoiler, Earth is also going to be part of that narrative world and it exists in, you know, wh whatever we want to call it, a different dimension, a different cosmos, right? And it's connected to this world of Arb that everything is, is set on where Fra Erasmus grows up. Now, Stevenson uh, does something kind of interesting the very first, so there's, there's two things that are really quite important here. He begins with a, a dictionary entry for anathem, right? The, what the, the whole thing is named after. In proto orth a poetic or, or musical invocation of our mother, Hylea, which since the time of uh, Adracones has been the climax of the daily literature, hence the fluckish word anathem, meaning a song of great emotional resonance, especially one that inspires listeners to sing along. Note... This sense is archaic and used only in a ritual context where it is unlikely to be confu confused with a much more commonly used sense number two. 
in new orth and out by which an incorrigible fra or sir is ejected from the math and his or her work sequestered, hence the fluckish word anathema, meaning intolerable statements or ideas. See throwback. <laughs> Now, there's a lot to, to comment on in that, and we're going to come to that in just a moment. But first, the other thing is a note to the reader. Anathem begins with this little note by Stevenson. If you are accustomed to reading works of speculative fiction and enjoy puzzling things out on your own, skip this note. Otherwise, know that the scene in which this book is set is not Earth but a planet called Arb that is similar to Earth in many ways. And then he starts giving us pronunciation hints. Arb is pronounced like Arb with a little something on the end. Consult a French person for advice. In a pinch, Arb will do. Two dots above a vowel are a diiresis, meaning that the vowel in question gets a syllable all of its own. So for example, deat is pronounced deat rather than deet. There's a, uh, you know, umlaut above the, the A. And then he tells us about Arban measurement units that have been translated into ones used on Earth. Where the Orth-speaking culture of this book has developed vocabulary based on the ancient precedents of Arb, I have coined words based on the old languages of Earth. Anathem is the first and most conspicuous example. It is a play on the words anthem and anathema, which derive from Latin and Greek words, right? And he, he goes on, and then he tells us names of some arban plant and animal species have been translated into rough Earth equivalents. So these characters may speak of carrots, potatoes, dogs, cats, etc. This doesn't mean that arb has exactly the same species. Naturally, Arb has its own plants and animals, right? And then he gives a timeline. A, he says, a very brief chronology of Arb's history follows. None of this will make much sense until you've read some pages into the work, but after that, it may be useful for reference. And it begins at minus 340 to, you know, 330, the approximate era of uh, Knoos and his daughters, Deat and Hylea. <laughs> so the ancient history and goes all the way up to the time of uh, plus 3689 when our story opens. Now, that, that's not all. We also have, towards the end, um, after the, the story concludes uh, with the final chapter, Reconstitution, a glossary, which is not a complete glossary. It doesn't include all the entries that we might want, but it, it is uh, quite quite interesting and quite useful. There, you know, for example, we find out that a deolator is one who favors Deat's interpretation of her father Kenos's vision and therefore believes in a heaven with a god in it. Compare physiologer, right? And then we can read Deat, one of the two daughters of Knos, the other being Hylea. She interpreted her father's vision as meaning that he had glimpsed a heavenly spiritual kingdom populated by angelic beings ruled by a supreme creator, which is also in one of the passages in the book that we're going to look at uh, shortly. So what, what have we got here? We've got like sort of an apparatus giving us some of the backstory. You notice this, this um, what would we call it, technique, of saying, uh, I'm translating these things into language that you can relate to, you earth people, this will make more sense to you. This is something that we see, again, Gene Wolfe doing in uh, the, you know, the, the New Sun books, and we find a lot of other people doing similar things. Now, this is one of the aspects of the work that uh, people are either hot or cold about. Some people really love this creation of new, not new vocabulary that's quite similar. So let's, let's return back to this uh, first entry, you know, anathem. In Proto-Orth, right, uh, so in early Orth, uh, we, we have an invocation of Mother Hylea. We have a reference to the Adracones, who we, we're not sure who those are. Hence the fluckish word anathem, you know, and we can guess, well, fluckish must be a language, right, or, or a culture. And then we go on further, uh, an out. Well, what's an out, right? Well, it's, a, it's like a ritual, a ritual that involves um, some, some significance by which an incorrigible fra or sir, okay, frere or sir, right, uh, brother or sister, is ejected from the math. The math is not 
mathematics, although a lot of mathematics goes on there, the math is where they live. <laughs> Right. And um, their work is sequestered, right? And then it says, see, throwback. Throwback is another thing uh, connected with this. So there's all this l lingo that's going on. And, you know, for some people, uh, this is really very welcome. For others, like myself, it can be a little bit precious and perhaps even irritating to have to see all this, you know, sound for savant. There's all sorts of interesting little, like, words that have changed a letter um, but that's part of how he's trying to build a world and this does kind of tie in with the philosophy a language is in a certain sense a structuring of intersubjective and intergenerational consciousness so placing us into a slightly different language one that where we know translation has taken place is in a way not just a you know let's let's liven things up by using uh, archaic language or making up words you know neologisms it's it's a way of trying to put us into that narrative universe now what can we say about this narrative universe it is in many respects like our own except that the world and its culture are quite different in important ways. And the most important distinction that's, that's going on here is the, you could say, the splitting of the world into the secular world where people are going out with their lives and the secular government exists and, you know, culture is happening. And that's where part of the, the story is actually going to go on. And then we have the world of, you know, the, the phrase and the sirs, the consents, the maths, the place in which we have something that at first might strike you as religious orders. But they're not really religious orders in the sense of committed to religious beliefs. Although there's a lot of, lot of discussion about, well, how exactly, how exactly should we understand these things? And the different orders involved in this understand their, themselves, their own history, and what it is that they're doing, and the other orders in different and rivalrous ways. So this is actually you know, an important aspect of that. Another key part of this that you can say runs throughout most of the orders is this Cartesian discipline, right? And what are these? Well, these are rules and rituals and structures and activities that divine uh, the way of living for somebody who's committed to that. And a vut, that is, that is somebody who is dedicated to this way of life. And it includes a myriad of different things that we learn about at different points through um, Erasmus and his friends encountering these, right? So what kind of clothing you can wear? Um, how do you interact with your fellow avuts and with other people in the secular world or the weird uh, quasi-connected thing of the Ita, right? Um, it governs what you can have as possessions. And they try to live a pretty simple life uh, without much technology, without uh, computers, except in certain, you know, connected ways that we'll talk about in a bit. And um, this is sort of like, as many people have pointed out, the rule of St. Benedict, but it's not the rule of St. Benedict because it's not oriented directly towards what the Order of St. Benedict is. By the way, if you don't know what the Order of St. Benedict or the rule of St. Benedict uh, involves, Benedictinism or the Benedictine monasteries and, and nunneries were, you could say, the most prolific and preeminent type of monastic orders in the West. There are other orders in other places, of course, in Egypt, in Palestine, in, in the uh, Greek Orthodox world, in other places as well. But in the Latin West, the Order of St. Benedict became, you know, probably one of the mon most important monastic orders and also really the center of a lot of culture, you know, um, 
Many great uh, uh, thinkers were, were working in these monasteries. They also were involved with the, the state. You might think of the connection between Lanfranc, a Benedictine monk, and William the Conqueror. Lanfranc becomes Archbishop of Canterbury, doesn't cease being a Benedictine monk, but he's doing uh, both, both churchly and monastic and also important political things along with this new Norman king. And we see a similar thing going on, but with much more conflict between Anselm of Canterbury, Lanfranc's successor, and the two uh, successors to, to William, uh, uh, William Rufus and Henry, who are both going to have problems with, with Anselm. Now, be that as it may, this, this understanding of life as being structured, as being put together in a way that you're not inventing on the spot. You're living out a, 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 something that's been sketched for you and lived out by many other people before you. There can be innovation. There can be development. For example, you know, Anselm, important theologian and philosopher, also an innovator when it comes to praying, believe it or not. So innovation can take place, but it's it's oriented not so much by the desire to understand, you know, philosophy or science or mathematics, it's ultimately oriented towards God. Now, is that the case in the orders in Anathem? There are some religious orders, the Deolaters, right, who have an interpretation of, you know, things that, that includes a God who, you know, looks kind of similar to the God of traditional theism here, but they are outliers. What is, what is the monastic life really about here? It's about science. It's about understanding mathematics. It's about philosophy. It's about praxis is the, the term uh, that we could say, you know, applied science, uh, engineering, things that are testable. And there's room for all sorts of ways in which this is lived out, but there is a common discipline in which one lives these things out. What else can we say about this at this point that that's particularly important? Well, I, I think that one of the key aspects of this that's particularly interesting is, um, and it's going to show up a lot in this, is that these, these uh, avuts, you call them monks if you want, monks and nuns, but avuts is, is, is really the term that's being used there. Their um, possessions are very restricted, and they basically have three things that all of them are, are allowed to use. A sphere, right, an actual globe, a cord, uh, sort of like a, a rope, and a bolt, something that they, a uh, fabric that they can wear over themselves. And these can be you know, expanded, contracted, knotted together in very interesting ways. They allow, for example, Erasmus to use these things to escape um, falling into an ice crevice. He can use the sphere to expand and, and contract and, you know, pull himself slowly out of the crevice. There's all sorts of uh, uses for these. And they're actually made out of a new kind of material or matter, new matter, right? Um, which is different than the matter of, of this cosmos. It's artificially produced. So there's some really interesting science going on there. That's one key aspect, right? The material possessions. Another really important aspect. Every so often, the the maths, the monasteries, open their doors and allow the avuts to go out into the world for a limited time and allow the world to come in. And they give lectures and, you know, the avuts go out and have adventures, like they get drunk. In, in Erasmus's case, he finds his, his older sister, right, who works in a machine shop. And there, there's all sorts of, Leo goes and gets in fights, gets beaten up and beats some people up. Um, now, this is called an apert, an opening, right? And it's very important because the novel begins at the time of an apert. And this is how, you know, uh, Erasmus can go and find his, his sister Cord, and you know, she's going to be involved in the story as well. 
And um, it allows the people on the outside to get some idea of what's going on. Now, each math is set up in a different way. One, one kind of math uh, opens up every single year for, you know, a week or so. And those, those uh, avuts are going to be fairly well connected with the outside world, right? Then there's the <clears throat> decan decanary or tenors uh, math. And that's, this is where Erasmus actually lives. You get to go outside every 10 years and then you come back in and that's how you live your life. Um, and then there's the hundreders, which only open every hundred years. And then there's the thousanders. And the thousanders, uh, you could say, well, how can anyone live for a thousand years? Well, they don't, but they take in newborn babies that, uh, you know, still have the umbilical cord attached because they don't want their mindset polluted by anything other than what's going on in that monastery. And we are actually going to meet up in, in the story with one of the thousanders, Fra Jod, right? Who has been, you know, in that, that in, in, throughout his entire life. So how is this all regulated through this clock that is an important part of the, the story? They, they, you know, they're tending to it in the early parts. Um, I did have a few passages I wanted to read, because I, but I don't want to go too much into this because I'm, I'm a bit worried about running out of time, we could say. What is the secular outside world like? There's a lot of ways to describe it. Here's one that comes in about, you know, halfway through the novel. Um, this is Erasmus. I looked with fascination at those people in their mobs and tried to fashion what it would be like. Thousands of years ago, the work that people did had been broken down into jobs that were the same every day in organizations where people were interchangeable parts. All of the story had been bled out of their lives. That's how it had to be. It was how you got a productive economy. But it would be easy to see a will at work behind this. Not exactly an evil will, but a selfish will. The people who'd made the system thus were jealous, not of money and not of power, but of story. If their employees came home at day's end with interesting stories to tell, it meant that something had gone wrong, a blackout, a strike, a spree killing. The powers that be would not suffer others to be in stories of their own unless they were fake stories that had been made up to motivate them. People who couldn't live without stories had been driven into the consents or into jobs like Yule's. All others had to look somewhere outside of work for a feeling that they were part of a story, which I guess, which is why seculars were so concerned with sports and with religion. How could you see yourself as part of an adventure otherwise? Something with a beginning, middle, and end in which you played a significant part. We have Oot had it ready-made because we were part of this project of learning new things. Even if it didn't always move fast enough for people like Jezri, it did move. You could tell where you were and where you, what you were doing in that story. Yule got all of this for free by living his stories from day to day, and the only drawback was the world held his stories to be of small account. Perhaps that's why he felt such a compulsion to tell them not just about his own exploits in the wilderness, but those of his mentors. So not everybody in the secular world is story starved in this way, but many people are. They have their jobs, things go along, you know, they go to the bars, they watch, you know, the, the speelies and, you know, shows and, and you know, they, they live kind of outside of their work life, dramatic lives, but they're dramatic lives that are manufactured stories, right? So there's some very interesting reflection here. What is it like to be involved in the story of an order that has been going on for thousands of years, carrying out some tasks, going through the process of human intellectual and moral development every single generation? That's something that perhaps attracts people to religious orders or to the orders of the Avut in this particular story, right? Um, Here's another little vignette of the world that, that he's inventing here. The library grape, right? 
The library grape had been sequenced by the avut of the consent of the lower Vrone in the days before the second sack. Every cell carried in its nucleus. The genetic sequence is not just of a single species, but every naturally occurring species of grape that the Vrone avut had ever heard of. And if those people hadn't heard of a grape, it wasn't worth knowing about. In addition, it carried excerpts from the genetic sequences of thousands of different berries, fruits, flowers, and herbs. Just those snatches of data that when invoked by the biochemical messaging system of the host cell produced flavor from molecules. Each nucleus was an archive vaster than the great library of Boz, storing codes for shaping almost every molecule nature had ever produced that left an impression on the human olfactory system. A given vine could not express all these genes at once. It couldn't be a hundred species of grape at the same time. So it decided which of these genes to express, which grape to be, which flavors to borrow, based on some impossibly murky and ambiguous data gathering and decision making process that the Ronavut had hand coded into its proteins. No nuance of sun, soil, weather, or wind was too subtle for the library grape to take into account. Nothing the cultivator did or failed to do went undetected or failed to have its consequences in the flavor of the juice. The library grape was legendary for its skill in penetrating the subterfuges of winemakers who are so arrogant as to believe they could trick it into being the same grape two seasons in a row. So he goes on here and he talks about, you know, um, different ways in which this can, can go wrong, can pan out. And then he talks about fanatics like Fra Orolo, one of, one of the important characters in this story, who had made the library grape his the library grape. <laughs> his advocation, right? Um, so what do we have here? We have a, a connection to grape growing, genetics, gastronomy, terroir, you know, all of this being carried out within the consent, all of this being carried out by Avuts, all of this done to produce some, some you know, great products. So, I mean, this kind of gives you an idea. It's not just people sitting there doing, you know, high level mathematics on chalkboards and, you know, thinking about philosophy. There's all these other aspects of the life and world involved. I do want to mention something about uh, some of the orders that are, that are involved in this. Um, so we'll run through this very quickly. And then perhaps we'll hit later on on some of the key themes involved, right? So the Holocarnians are connected to St. Holocarn or any of the other orders that claim descent from this split between the semantic and syntactic faculties. Um, they're often seen as the opponents of the Prochians. Uh, the Prochians are connected to St. Proc or any of the other orders that claim descent from the syntactic faculties. The Prochians are, in a certain respect, nominalists, in, in the sense that we would use the term. And the Holocarnians are, in a certain respect, Platonists, in, an, in a way that you know, they, they believe in um, some special, better world that looks a lot like Plato's world of the forms, which we'll talk about in, in a bit. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's other groups as well. The Phanians split off from the Prochians. They collaborate with the Holocarnians in adva advancing genetic sequencing technology. <clears throat> they get disbanded and a lot of them join the ETA, right? Um, who are the Ita? The Ita are yet another group that aren't really in order as such. And by the way, their, their name actually comes from information technology. And then there's a whole bunch of possible A's. The Ita are a artisanal caste that are tolerated in the consents built around the great clocks. Um, the Ita... Uh, maintain all the subsystems that, that employ what they call syntactic devices. Their, their task is to operate and maintain these while being separated from the Avut. And we're going to see the Ita being brought together with the Avut as the story goes on. Um, Adharian, the Adharian order, is founded um, by St. Edhar. They focus on theorics and metatheorics and uh, are, are on the Holocarnian side. This is where um, part of the story actually takes place in the beginning. And that's, you know, where um, Erasmus is being brought up. 
Um, two other really important orders that we can talk about, the ringing veil, right? The ringing veil are people who focus on veil lore, which is physical combat techniques and the development of strategy mind. They also have a really interesting discussion that doesn't get quite followed out in thinking about emergences, uh, times and places where a radical uh, important decision has to be made and where one has to act. Then there's the Lorites. <laughs> the Lorites are a particularly interesting order founded by St. Laura. Um, the basis of their, their order is St. Laura's, Laura's proposition, which states all possible ideas have already been found. There is nothing new to discover. What do the Lorites do? They are perpetually, you know, in relation to the other orders where a new idea is found saying, oh, well, that's not really that new of an idea. It, it's already found back here somewhere else. And interestingly, this, this idea uh, about, uh, you know, all, all possible ideas have already been found was itself, um, let me see if I can find this, this reference, um, this, this idea itself is the last real new idea. You could call it a meta idea, right? Here we go. So there's a discussion that takes place really early on. Every idea the human mind could come up with had already been come up with by that time. It's a very influential idea. Wait a minute. Wasn't St. Laura, Laura's idea a new idea? According to Orthodox Paleolorites, it was the last idea. And he's, well, okay, what have we all been doing here for the 2,100 years since the last idea has come up with it? Yeah, to be blunt about it. Not everybody agrees with this proposition. Everybody loves to hate the Lorites. Some call her a warmed over mystagogue and worse, but Lorites are good to have around. Why? Whenever anyone comes up with an idea that they think is new, the Lorites converge on it like jackals and try to prove it's actually 5,000 years old or something. More often than not, they're right. <laughs> Isn't that, isn't that great? Now, there are a few other uh, movers and shakers that we should talk about. One is the lineage. So the lineage is pre-Mathic, um, a theoric tradition that was looking for a deeper understanding of what's called the Hylian theoretic world. Uh, or it's got an origin earlier than Cartas and her discipline, and they are, you know sort of like behind the scenes operating for millennia, and they play an important uh, role in, in the plot that is going to develop. So that is probably enough at this point in time about the world building. The last thing that we have to say is that all of this takes place at a time of shakeup, of, of emergence, to use the, you know, the uh, veil uh, uh, consents ideas in which the secular and the uh, consent of Oot world are going to come together in interesting, unusual ways to face a common enemy. But that's probably enough about that. I, I will just say this. I've only scratched the surface on the incredibly complex world that is depicted and described within this massive volume. So, you know, I invite you to read it yourself and learn more about that. I found that reading reviews of literature can be quite helpful, both if you haven't read the book already and if you've already read the book. And I'm talking about good reviews. And I don't mean good in the sense of glowing or positive reviews, the sort of silliness that you see on the backs of covers like, you know, for example, in time, whatever happened to the great novel of ideas that has morphed into science fiction and Stevenson is its foremost practitioner, you know, those sort of um, butt kissing blurbs, we could call them, right? Uh, that's not particularly helpful, unless it happens to be absolutely true. Um, but, you know, given that everybody, everybody's book has wonderful things like that on it, they're probably not, right? Especially if we include terms like foremost or best or, you know, relative terms. Instead, I want to see reviews that have some meat, that have some teeth, that challenge us, that have something that they put on the table. And so that can be helpful 
in you know before you read the book, getting some sense of is this going to be a good book or a bad book? Should I read it? Should I avoid it? Um, what am I putting myself in for? But I think it's also very helpful once you've actually read a book to read somebody else's reviews and be like, oh yeah, that person, they add something to my look at it. Maybe I was too hasty in judging this over here, but it's also nice to get some corroboration, right? From another person that you're not, your responses aren't completely uh, eccentric, eccentric, you know, or extrinsic or um, off base, right? That there, other people are bothered by some of these aspects or enjoyed aspects as well. So I've assembled a number of, I think, quite good reviews in that sense. I disagree with quite a few of them on some things, but I think that they can be quite helpful to go through. You might, as we're reading these, respond to them uh, in you know the comments or in, in the chat or stuff like that, or just take some notes and see what you think. So here's the first one, a very short one by Andrew McKee in The Telegraph. I think this novel is wonderful, so I don't want to put you off, but let's be clear, there is plenty to put you off. There is a strong case for thinking this book utterly tiresome. Please don't. You'll miss quite a lot if you do. That is what belongs on the back cover of this book. That would be the best blurb I could think of because it's it's very honest and it's kind of paradoxical, right? This is a tiresome book. There, there are things that are tiresome about it. We're going to get into some of that in just a bit. And yet, if you can persevere and plow through and get acclimated to the narrative world that we're, we're working within, you're actually going to like it quite a bit. So, I mean, we can say this, I think, about other people's fantasy or sci-fi or horror, pick whatever else kinds of worlds as well. Let's talk about the next one. Now, the next one is a glowing kiss buddy, you know, I'm so clever kind of thing by Andrew Leonard at Salon. Anathem pulls off what most writers would never dare attempt. It is simultaneously a page turner and a philosophical argument, an adventure novel and an extended existential meditation, a physics lesson, sermon and ripping good yarn. Anathem also resonates with social observations rooted in our time right now on Earth. The names have changed, but the geometry remains the same. If you are already a fan of Stevenson, you will not be disappointed. You will be utterly engrossed. If you like a little dash of philosophy in your science fiction, you will be delighted. If you wrote a dissertation on German idealism, you will think you've died and gone to heaven. Can I hear an amen? If you don't like philosophy, hate math, and desire more character development than Kant in your fiction, best to stay away. Now, this is some glib shit, isn't it? Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's some bits of truth to it. Um, it is not a page turner until you get at least halfway through it, right? And then it, it really does pick up that way. Is the whole thing a philosophical argument or an extended existential meditation? Nah, not really. There's lots of philosophy in it. I wouldn't say the whole thing is a philosophical argument. And that shows that this reviewer doesn't either doesn't know what he's talking about or was just playing fast and loose with words to seem like he's he's cleverer than he is. Um, I, I do think that, you know, if you like Stevenson already, you'll probably like this one kind of the way it works with most authors. Um, if you like a little dash of philosophy in your science fiction, you will be delighted. Sure, that, that's quite true. If you wrote a dissertation on German idealism, you'll think you have died and gone to heaven. That is complete, utter pandering nonsense, right? Um, first off, there's not a lot of German idealism connected with this. More, you know, there's Platonism, there's, you know, uh, uh, quantum mechanics things, there's things on, on philosophy of language. So bringing in the, the thing about Kant and German idealism is just pure, pure pandering for people who might have encountered that in the, you know, um, online sphere with references to it or in intro to philosophy classes. Um, in a way, the more philosophy that you know that, that Stevenson is working with and referencing, in a way, the less satisfying the book actually turns out to be. Uh, let's look at the next one. Now, this is, uh, this is a much more pejorative one. Oh, Anathem will certainly be admired for its intelligence, ambition, control, and ingenuity, but loved? Enjoyed? 
The made-up language is rebarbative. The plot moves with elephantine slowness. Much is confusing. The process of decipherment actually drives the book as the characters and reader try to figure things out in big capitals. Every so often we just stop for a long info dump or debate about cosmology, philosophy, semantics, or similar glitzy arcana. For the most part, Stevenson's prose lacks any particular grace or beauty, at least to my ear. And while he can be mildly satirical at times, these precious moments are few. On the other hand, the descriptions of buildings, machines, events seem to go on for millennia. Sex is referred to, but never actually seen. Alas, there's worse. This is Michael Deirda in the Washington Post. I'd say he's off base. I mean, I mean, do we do we need a lot of sex in stories? Um, there's enough stories out there with tons of it in there that you know that actually get complained about too much sex in this one. So that's kind of a weird one to uh, be concerned with. Um, you know, a lot of this is is pretty subjective stuff. Um, but we'll say this: loved or enjoyed. Well, a lot of people do love and enjoy this book. That's why it got recommended to me. And that's why I ultimately did this. I don't love it. And I did enjoy parts of it. Um, but I recognize that there's many other people out there with takes. And many people really did love this book and, and still do. The made up language. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big issue with the book. Um, I think a lot of us find it off-putting in, in different ways. Um, the plot moves with elephantine slowness. Uh, that's a little bit of exaggeration, um, but it is it is pretty slow moving in the first part. Much is confusing, but then you know he admits that well, much has to be confusing because this is a book that has uh, the plot of characters and readers trying to figure things out. So it, it is confusing, but it's not confusing just to be confusing or because Stevenson couldn't handle. Um, the, the plot that he's developing. It's confusing because the characters are confused about what's going on. So that's kind of a, a good point, actually. Um, here's another thing. This is by Charles Soule in Tor. And this, this also has to do with um, the language stuff. It all feels just familiar enough that we're never completely lost, but it also feels very other, very different, very fresh. That alone is an incredible feat of writerly engineering. It's hard enough to come up with one cool name for something, much less a hundred or so, each feeling appropriate and right. But then the really truly awesome thing, Stevenson pulls yet another card out of his deck and reveals that Arb feels similar to Earth because it almost is Earth. It's a parallel dimension where the language evolves slightly differently, but that doesn't mean our Earth isn't part of the story too. We discover this when a minor character in the story is revealed to have been an alien interloper all along. An alien from our world, Earth, called La Terre in the book, because the alien also happens to be French. Our own history on our own world exists within the world of Anathem. You and I are part of the story. It's just mostly left off stage. So a uh, spoiler there, right? Uh, I, I said that there would be spoilers in this, this uh, uh, discussion. Um, so, you know, I mean, this, this is a, a decent explanation of why the names all have to be this weird, you know, sans so-and-so, fra, sur, you know, just almost like one letter off when it comes to, to things, right? And, you know, this provides a justification. It doesn't eliminate the annoyingness of the, the language that eventually you just have to get past, I think. Here's another one, longer uh, passage, uh, from Christopher Brookmere in The Guardian. I think there's some really interesting insights here. The obvious early point of reference is Mervyn Peake's Gorman Gas novels, as Stevenson immerses the reader in a world of ritual and order, the reasons for which are not entirely understood by their adherents. These are people who think as a vocation, deconstructing the reasoning behind every statement, yet even in such a culture, ritual can take hold and impose an order whole centuries after the reasons for it have been forgotten. Arbs is a civilization several thousand years more mature than our own. I say mature rather than advanced as there's a deep sense of technological ages, largely forgotten, buried under cataclysm. However, 
The beating heart of this novel is philosophy. If I may borrow an analogy from Professor Stephen Law at times, Anathem is not so much a workout in the philosophy gym as philosophy extreme sports. The history of the Avut is punctuated by the breakthrough ideas of sounds, all of them replicating concepts familiar to us here on Earth through Plato, Euclid, Leibniz, Newton, and so on. Edmund Husserl's copper ashtray becomes Adamant's bowl. Occam's razor becomes Sant Garden's steelyard. This is more than mere facsimile. The most powerful and controversial idea among the Avut concerns the Hylian theoric world and the question of whether the same ideas will occur independently to thinkers on different planets because there are certain transcendental truths, prime numbers, the value of pi, the laws of geometry that exist on some higher plane. So a lot of, a lot of things going on there, right? I think he's right that we can see a, a parallel here between um, what is going on in the maths and the consents, essentially the, the world of the, or the inner world of the avuts, uh, right? <clears throat> we can see something like that uh, in the Gorman-Gast novels. I also think that, I mean, we might think of other um, series, you know, Gene Wolfe's, um, you know, works come to mind here. He does similar things with language and, you know, it's a dying earth way in the, the future. Um, books of the new sun, right? Same thing with ritual that's not understood. Why do we do things this way? Ah, who knows? You know, we just keep doing it like this. Um, I would say that, you know, speaking of, of dying earth, Jack Vance and um, also Tanith Lee's stuff certainly seem to cover the similar ground as well. Um, although, you know, they're not really centered around entire, uh, not even classes, but like lineages of people who are working on these sorts of things. So that's, you know, that, that's quite interesting. Um, I, I like this point about Arb being a civilization more mature, but not, you know, not necessarily more advanced than our own. That is a really great, um, idea. Is Anathem uh, not a workout in the philosophy gym, but more philosophy extreme sports? I would say both of those don't, don't really work because, I mean, extreme sports, you got to do lots and lots of training for it. Um, I guess, you know, insofar as like when we watch extreme sports and we see displays of virtuosity, it could be like that because that we're not getting an awful lot of real, you know, um, deployment of those things. I mean, I'd say that, you know, um, a couple platonic dialogues probably have more interesting and deep running philosophy than the entirety of, of this, this work, but I uh, pick the right dialogues, right? <laughs> Obviously not the ion or, you know, things like that. Um, and you know, he does lift stuff basically out of, um, the philosophy of our world and put it into the mouths of his characters and the minds of the characters. But there is a real problem being raised here in terms of the Hylian theoric world. So I think that, you know, Brookmeyer really did zero in on things here. Um, Dave Itzkoff in the New York Times brings up Plato's Republic, and he says that, this is in book 10, um, Socrates delineates three categories of art, one which uses another which makes, a third which imitates them. The last of these three Socrates holds in the lowest regard because it's a copy of the copy of the truth, an inferior who marries an inferior and has inferior offspring. My reluctant conclusion is that Anathem spends so much time engaged in copying, in conjuring up alternative formulations of our real world science and religion, that it forgets to come up with much that is new or true. Too much of the book is dominated by lengthy dialectical debates whose conclusions are hardly earth-shattering. What's worse, the book's fixation on dialogue leads Erasmus and Stevenson to simply tell us what is happening or has happened in pivotal scenes instead of allowing us to see the events for ourselves through descriptive action. And when Erasmus and his confederates at, late, at last make their way onto that alien ship, you may wonder what all this has to do with the larger theme Stevenson spends the first 300 pages of his 900-page novel laying out. I think this is an unfair review. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's partly right. I think that there's, there's a... It's a dangerous strategy to just engage in copying what we've got here over into a world here 
And, you know, to find out that, that they're copying something from Plato or Husserl or um, Occam or pick whoever else you like, um, if, you've, if, if, if you're getting introduced to these ideas for the first time or you're kind of at an intermediate level, it's really fun to recognize that and to play around with it. I would say somebody who did a way better job at that is Philip K. Dick in, in his novels where people are talking about you know particular ideas and then really exploring them. Uh, I don't know that that happens that much in some of what's going on in here. Um, so I think that's right about it. But um, the book's fixation on dialogue leads Erasmus to simply tell us what's happening. I think that the descriptions are perfectly good. It doesn't all have to be, you know, third person narration or something. I, I thought I, I was able to get into the story myself. And I think that um, Itzkoff just kind of he missed something when he's saying uh, when they make their way onto the alien ship, you may wonder what all this has to do with the larger themes. Stevenson spends the first 300 pages. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's there's lots of connections there. So I think Itzkoff was probably an inattentive reader by the time that he got to the end, which can, you know, is, is understandable since this is such a massive tome, right? Um, here is another interesting one. Um, Anathem offers readers a very steep learning curve during the first 200 pages. However, once Erasmus's world is established, it's easy to enjoy this adventurous, funny, and intelligent science fiction novel. Yes, those first 200 pages can be difficult, but remember, soon you'll be reading about mathematicians and philosophers defending their planet against alien invaders. It's also worth taking the time to do your homework on the history of philosophy and quantum mechanics. Both of these subjects will be discussed in detail, though Stevenson's taken the liberty of changing most of the words. <laughs> Consequently, there's a need for several lectures over the course of the novel, and Stevenson has devised uh, several means by which the avowed can meet, discuss, and debate these ideas so as not to become repetitive. My favorite might be called the Messel, in which several senior avut dine and discuss ideas while more junior avut serve them. The junior avut can express their boredom with the dinner by leaving the room, at which point we're treated to a somewhat gossipy academic discussion in the servitor's area about the dinner's discussion. At other times, Stevenson's characters simply walk along while engaged in conversations that recall Socratic questioning. Add to this Stevenson's tendency to engage in lengthy digressions, and we have a novel that's perfectly suited for Stevenson's fans. However, Anathem might not be the best novel for newcomers. It's certainly not for Stevenson skeptics. It took me several tries to get past Arb's jargon and engage with Erasmus's story. Having said that, once I did get into the story, I did not resent the effort. I was hooked and quite sad to see the story end. Anathem is notable for many reasons, particularly the detailed rules and the history of the mathic world, but perhaps the best thing about the book is that readers who finish it will find themselves wanting to start over. That was Ryan Skardal in fantasy literature. So that, that's an interesting point. I would be genuinely uh, intrigued to find out how many readers did, in fact, want to start over. I did not myself have that um, particular take. It was more like, whew, now I'm finally at the end. I, th I, I wish there was more of the story. I will say that. I agree with him there. But it didn't make me say, wow, I got to get back into this a second time. I, I may reread this in the future. I don't know. But um, maybe there are some people who are like, man, I got to go back to the beginning now and reread this a second time, which, you know, uh, would, would make sense for Stevenson fans. I really like this, this discussion here about um, how it is that Stevenson managed in a literary way to bring in these expository discussions. And, you know, he's not the only author to do this. This is something that goes, you know, way back into speculative fiction literature. Lovecraft did this. You know, you find uh, exposition like this in Dracula, you know, Bram Stoker. Um, we can think of all sorts of people who, who do this. I mean, it's interesting. Stanislaw Lem <clears throat> um, does this himself and also criticizes other people for introducing ideas that don't really work, that are just made up stuff. A.E. Van Voigt, you know, is, is somebody who both Lem and uh, Damien Knight went after on that account. Stevenson is, is referring to things that have, you know, a real 
basis in the history of philosophy or in quantum mechanics or in the you know conceptions about consciousness that are that are going on today um and I think he actually does a pretty good job in introducing these things. Uh, somebody else who also does similar things in his works, Umberto Eco. You know, if you've actually read Umberto Eco's texts, not his novels, but his texts like on philosophy of language or semiotics, you'll find him basically having the characters give lectures that are coming out of Eco's books. Um, that doesn't make it bad. It's a question of how it's done. There is a very steep learning curve, as um, uh, Skardal points out in the first 200 pages. Um, but, you know, there, once you break, um, it, it does become a, a, a good story. Um, finally, Joe Walton and Tor, who's written several different things about Anathem. I started thinking about why Stevenson had chosen to set the story in a different world rather than set, set it 4,000 years or so in our own future. There's a good plot reason, of course, which is having people from our world show up later, one of the big reveals, right? But it could just as well have said it 4,000 years in the future and had aliens rather than people from our world and other cosmoses. Since the first time I read Anathem, I've been assured by people I trust who know about science that essentially the many worlds alternative physics stuff is all wrong. While the French is cute in that, it could have been aliens and been fine. The bit I like least about Anathem is the bit in space, the probabilistic millenarian ex machina stuff. So he could have lost that, not annoyed Maris and other physics people and kept everything I adore about the book. I actually disagree. Um, I think, you know, I, I would say the, you know, is the physics stuff all wrong? No, it's, it's pretty much impossible for it to be all wrong. And I think there's a lot of things that are still being hashed out. I'm not necessarily endorsing uh, the, the physics and the uh, speculations about consciousness in the book myself, but I'm, I'm more willing to go along with them. I don't know about this. I think there's something to be gained, contra Joel Walton, by having uh, Earth come into it. It's almost a... It reminds me of Borges and the way that he writes stuff with his kinds of reveals in which we find out that, oh, no, no, we've been in, in the story all along. So a lot of great stuff in these reviews, I would say. I know I've taken a lot of time talking about this, but you know, it hits a lot of the important plot points, and I think this is well worth discussing. In the interest of time, because I don't want this to get overly long, and also because of the way this novel is structured, I'm not going to do what I've done in many other of these, these talks, which is to focus in on individual philosophical themes and exploit and explore them in, in great detail, and then leave the others out, of course, because we can only cover so many. Instead, I'm going to shift our focus to the plot of the novel, which as it unfolds, brings some of these themes in very explicitly and also gives us a really interesting twist to think about. So we've got, you know, Erasmus, at, who's you know coming of age in his consent and um, you know connected with this Fra Orlo who's going to get kicked out very soon. Anathem is going to be pronounced against him and he's going to be sent away. Um, Erasmus himself also gets in trouble and winds up having to you know engage with this punishment called the book. Right? We're gonna we're gonna put that aside for the moment and think about the bigger picture, which is that things are changing. There's something happening in the sky that Erasmus and Orlo and others are very interested in. As it's going to turn out, this is not a military thing. It's not a satellite. It is an alien spaceship. And this is being kept under wraps. Why? Well, because Nobody's quite sure exactly what to do about it. And there's, there's some high-level coordination that is going to be taking place between the secular world, specifically their military and decision makers, and the uh, avuts, the, the people who really know science and work on it, and they're going to become connected. And there's actually going to be this, this great sending forth from the maths and consents uh, of, of the um, people who might be able to work on it. And Erasmus is one of those who is 
sent out, along with, as he finds on the way, this guy, Fra Jad, who is a thousander. He's, he's in that special part of, you know, that special math that is almost, you know, disconnected from the outside world, openly opens its doors once every thousand years. And there's lots of, you know, great adventure story happening on the way and revelations and wondering about what's going on. And I'm going to sort of fast forward us to where the, the aliens are actually being encountered and where they realize something really key. The matter that the aliens are made of is not the same thing as the matter from the cosmos. I almost said our cosmos, but our cosmos is one of the aliens, right? Uh, La Terre is Earth in this story. So Arb, the matter that people are composed of, is slightly different than those of La Terre or the other three worlds, as it turns out, that all these people come from. And this has some significant effects. You can eat the food of a different cosmos but you can't digest it. You can't derive any nourishment from it. You can breathe the air, <clears throat> but it's going to mess you up. And it takes a long period of acclimation to be able to use the oxygen that is in somebody else's cosmos's air. And <clears throat> it gets even trippier. We find out that part of the backstory of what has been going on. And we find this out from a guy whose name is Jules Verne, but he's not the Jules Verne, right? We find out that there is a um, plurality of worlds indeed, which gets, gets brought up at this um, assembly, right? And um, it's, it's being dismissed by Fra Lodiger, who is a uh, member of the, these you know, Prochian, the rhetoricians, right? And um, here we go. Plurality of wor worlds, he says, sounds impressive. I haven't the faintest idea of what it means to some here. The mere fact of the geometers, that's the name for the aliens, existence proves that there is at least one other world, and at one level it's quite trivial. But since it appears I'm the token procreant at this messel, I shall play my role and say this. We have nothing in common with these geometers. No shared experiences, no common culture. Until that changes, we can't communicate with them. Why not? Because language is nothing more than a stream of symbols that are perfectly meaningless until we associate them in our minds with meaning, a process of acculturation, until we share experiences with the geometers and thereby begin to develop a shared culture. In effect, to merge our culture with theirs, we cannot communicate with them. And their efforts to communicate with us will continue to be just as incomprehensible as the gestures they've made so far. For example, throwing the warden of heaven out the airlock, dropping a fresh murder victim into a cult site, and rotting a volcano. Now, this is a very interesting point. And Lodiger would be correct if it wasn't for the fact that something else is, is going on. And this is a good place to bring in one of these key ideas. This is of the Hylian theoric world, which the Prochians totally reject. And the Phanians thought that belief in was actually a kind of religion. And what is this Hylic theoric world? It is the Platonic world of the forms, understood not just, say, through Plato, but the way that Neoplatonists would understand it. Um, the name used by adherents of protism to denote the higher plane of existence populated by perfect geometric forms. This is coming from the glossary. Theorems and other pure ideas, knoons, named after Hylia, one of the two daughters of Knoos, right? And so there's, there's a simple way of understanding this and a complex way of understanding this. And we can say similar things with, with you know, Platonism, whether it's the Platonism of Plato's dialogues or the fuller conceptions of Platonism developed in middle and later Platonism, you know, Neoplatonism, or those developed by bringing it into a religious perspective in our own times. So we have simple and complex protism. Simple protism says that there's two cosmi, two cosmoses, right? And one is more purely Hylian than the other. 
So you've got the Hylian theoric world, the world of the forms, and then you have the Arborin causal domain, the world that we see, right? Plato talked about this as the visible and the invisible, the, the tangible material, the noetic, the intelligible world that we could grasp. And the information leads from, and causality, from one cosmos to another, and it is unidirectional, right? And so, you know, this is typical Platonism, as we've encountered it in the past, right? Then we have something a little bit trickier, and this is where it gets very, very interesting. Complex protism, developed by Sir Uthantin and her fid fra Erasmus, the namesake, the guy that, that Erasmus is named after in this, um, involves multiple cosmoses that are arranged in an order from the more purely Hylian to the less purely Hylian. And the Hylian flow exists between these, cosmo these cosmoses. And so um, in this way, the cosmoses actually do share something in common. It isn't the case that the people from the other cosmos would have nothing in common with us, nothing, no connection with us they are interpreting the Hylian theoric world in a different way. They are living things out in a different manner, but there are going to be similarities. And interestingly, the cosmoses can lead from one to the other, can call from one to the other. And so we find out that uh, Lodiger's worries about this you know, multi-world hypothesis uh, aren't real worries after all. And in this, this uh, gathering, they set up a, a Faraday um, cage, right? And, and here's where we start to, to uh, realize some stuff. So this is where one of the big plot twists happens, right? He says, um, in my world, said Javern, we call it a Faraday cage, right? In our world, Earth. Um, he stood up and shrugged his bolt over his head, then tossed it to the floor, um, I could, you know, look on the face of a, a living alien, judging from the back of his head and torso. I judged he was of the same race as the dead woman who'd come down with the probe. As we're going to find out, that's actually his wife, right? Uh, beneath a sort of undershirt, a small device was attached to his skin with tape. He throws it on there. I am Jules Verne Durand of La Terre, the world you know as Antarct. Orhin is from the world of Ornud, which you have de designated Panja. You'd best get him inside the Faraday cage. And they, they do that. And then he starts unveiling the story. You know, um, we have been traveling through the cosmos and there has been a sequence of four different cosmoses connected together. They're all on this massive colony ship, which has changed purpose and uh, uh, you could say governance several times. And there's actually a division between the four different human races on this colony ship, all of whom have different, uh, you could say, material, none of whom are, complete, are completely compatible with each other's uh, cosmos, their air, their food, their, their water all those sorts of things. And they, they move, first one goes to another planet and then uses the resources, takes on some of the people. Then they move to another cosmos, another Earth, another Orth, another you know, Arb, right? And with each one, there's a different set of mindsets and capacities that's taken on. Then they run into Arb. And Arb is, in a certain way, a more ideal dimension, a more ideal planet. And they're the ones who are actually able to put up real resistance and force a new, we could call it, new manner of association, a new uh, diplomacy, a new working out and sharing of information. And that is what happens in the very end of this story. There's lots of other things that are happening along the way, like an assault on the alien spaceship and traveling, uh, you know, to, to uh, the, the, the Arctic realm and fall, you know, fighting people and all, all sorts of other really great stuff. But that is the basic plot point. And what we could call this is you could say in some respects, a triumph of a, an attenuated sort of Platonism 
over nominalism, there's more as well. It's also connected with the conception of human consciousness, that human consciousness itself would be operating within many possible ways of grasping the cosmos, which can also be separate cosmoses, and that through you know study, application, intuition, all these things that are available to us as human beings that can be refined, maybe we can even manipulate which cosmos is the real in a, a you know scare quote sense cosmos that we're in so we have platonism and nominalism we have other uh cosmoses and what it would be like to be an alien being who's not completely alien uh, alternate timelines alternate histories alternate modes of social development and all sorts of very interesting speculations on consciousness coming together in this novel of which i've basically just scratched the surface but this should be hopefully enough to get you into it.